Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the inaugural event for our Python Exchange. I recognize many of your names from the attendee chat, and there's a couple of names that I don't recognize. But I'll start off by introducing myself. My name is James Powell, and many of you may know me from some of the volunteer work that I do for the PyData community and for the nonprofit NumFocus. Uh, it is my absolute pleasure to be a part of volunteering to make this event possible. Because as part of my volunteering work for NumFocus and for the PyData conference series, it is my goal to ensure that tools like NumPy, Pandas, NetworkX, Matplotlib, and other tools in the open source scientific computing ecosystem have a place and a home for producing scientific results and are able to thrive in environments such as the national labs. Now, I'm going to run you very quickly through what our plan for tonight is, but before I do that, I want to advise you of three things. First, this call will be recorded, and we'll put a little bit of production behind the scenes just to cut it down to the, the salient parts, and we'll provide that recording to all of you who attended, and it'll be posted online as well. Second, as a con consequence of this call being recorded, please do not ask any questions or contribute any information related to anything that is cleared or otherwise privileged. And finally, this is not just one event, but one in a series of multiple events that we want to hold going off into the indefinite future. The next event will be on the 1st of December, it's also a Wednesday, at the same time slot, and we'll shortly be in contact with all of you to let you know about who the speakers will be, what the topic will be. But in general, our goal from this event and our topic is, how do we ensure that scientific users within the national labs can make good on Python, can see Python succeed, have the resources, the community, and everything that they need in order to allow Python to thrive? Here's how we're going to run this call tonight. If you look in your BlueJeans client at the top right, you can see there is a Q&A widget. That Q&A widget will allow you to ask questions of all of your panelists live as we go. We'll ask you to submit those questions in text just so that we don't have to get all 40 of you on video simultaneously. That never works out too well. And all of the panelists will be available to answer that question for you, whether it is our lead panelist for tonight, Eric, or some of the additional supporting panelists from the various labs. In just a moment, I'll ask those panelists to introduce themselves. And as part of introducing themselves, they'll also tell you a little bit more about what you could ask them that they can specifically help you with. For example, whether or not it is possible to bring open source tools into your environment, whether or not specific tools may be appropriate for a supercomputing environment, whether or not certain tools are exascale ready or not. Whatever the case may be, your panelists are here in order to help you figure out how to make the right connections or do whatever it takes in order to allow Python to thrive in your life. Let me start off uh, introducing our panelists. And so why don't we go in this order? We'll first ask our panelists from BNL from NSLS2 to introduce themselves, then our panelists from ANL APS to introduce themselves, and then our panelists from LNL LC. And so Dan and Tom, would you like to introduce yourselves? Dan? Sure. Sure. I'm a disembodied voice today because of camera issues, so I beg your patience with that. My uh, name is Daniel Allen. I am a scientific software developer and a group leader in the Data Science and Systems Integration Program at NSLS2. And in particular, I'd be happy to, to take any questions or discussion about building ground-up open source uh, software collaborations across DOE facilities. Tom? Huh? Hi. My name is Thomas Caswell. I'm also in the Data Science and Systems Integration uh, Program at NSLS2. Um, in addition to my responsibilities at BNL, I'm also the project lead of Matplotlib and a core developer of H5Pi. Um, if you have any questions about how to integrate with and work with existing open source projects and how to get involved in those communities, I'd be happy to uh, answer any questions about that. Now, it'd be my pleasure to help introduce our contributors from APS at ANL, Pete and Joe Sullivan. Pete? Good afternoon. Thanks for the um, introduction. I'm Pete Jemian from the Advanced Photon Source at Argonne National Labs. I've been involved with uh, instrument control for several decades. I'm currently leading the effort to integrate a certain Python framework for instrument control and data acquisition to um, the advanced photon source X-ray uh, measurement facilities, the beam lines. 
If you have any questions on uh, Beamline Controls or on Nexus, I've been a member of the Nexus International Advisory Council for um, 15 years. Just give me a call. And finally, I know Joe's having a little bit of difficulty with the audio and video. Joe? Yeah, hi. Uh, yeah, thank you, James. I'm Joe Sullivan. I'm uh, a, gr a group leader at uh, for the Beamline Controls group at the uh, Advanced Photon Source. Um, I've been in machine control for 30 years, so if you have any questions about scripting languages and how they interface to machine control software, uh, feel free to ask. Thank you. And then finally, our supporting panelists from Livermore Computing at Livermore National Labs, uh, Jean and Jane. Jane, I know that Jean may be joining us a little bit late, so if you could introduce her on her behalf as well. Um, sure, yeah. So my name is Jane Harriman. I'm another uh, disembodied voice for today. So both uh, Jean Schuler and I work at Lawrence Livermore National Lab as part of um, the well, Livermore Computing's uh, hotline. We're technical consultants in the customer service group, so that means that we uh, help users um, that call in and are having trouble maybe you know, running Python on our systems or compiling something or, or getting one piece of, of software in their stack or another to work. Um, I guess there are a great number of things that uh, that Jean is able to help with. She she certainly knows a lot about LC and uh, Livermore Lab as a whole. Um, as for me, I, the things that are coming to mind right now are more specific to Livermore's environment. Like if you're trying to get started with Python, I help a lot of our users who are um, trying to figure out how to set up like custom Python kernels in our instance of Jupyter Hub and that sort of thing and working with virtual environments. Fantastic. Now, I have posted an initial question in the BlueJeans Q&A widget just to ask all of our panelists how we can reach out to them after the call. Hopefully, they'll be able to share their email addresses with all of you, and you can see that's exactly the place where you should put all of your questions as they come up. But without further ado, I would like to introduce your lead panelist for our discussion. Eric is going to present to us specifically about topics related to his work, especially his open source work on a tool called NetworkX. He'll speak for a bit, and then we'll open it up for any additional general discussion between the panelists. Eric Hagbert is the Deputy Division Leader of Computer Computational and the Statistical Sciences Division at Los Alamos National Laboratory. He is, I believe, the founding and core developer for a very, very powerful tool in Python, NetworkX, a tool for network analysis. We are absolutely privileged today to be able to hear from Eric. He's going to present to us a lot about how, how these tools come together and to talk a little bit about the main theme for tonight, why Python? Why Python? And so why don't I hand it over to Eric, and we'll hear a little bit about that. Eric? Uh, thank you so much for the invitation to speak at this DOE Exchange kickoff event. It's pretty exciting. I'm going to talk about why Python, but not so much directly answering why or making a list of whys. I'm going to talk about the history and development of the Network X package for network science. And in that context, I'll try to answer the what and the how of the development of Network X, and that should give you some answers and clues about why. Um, to start off, I'd like to go back 20 years to October 2001 and talk about the beginning of Network X. I joined a project at Los Alamos that was using census and transportation simulation data for a city to build dynamic network models of epidemic spread. Um, the idea was to create and study model outbreaks and seek intervention strategies. For example, who should be vaccinated first to slow the spread, or which people in the network are high risk of spreading infections to others. Uh, initially, we were studying smallpox, but later included SARS, uh, the original SARS, flu, and other infectious diseases. Diseases. Um, this is, of course, very relevant to all of our lives today, and Lanel and many others are doing modeling and simulation for SARS. So we needed some software we, we, to test ideas about what properties of the network or of the network nodes, in this case it was people or buildings, um, might be related to controlling the epidemic spread. We, we needed tools. We needed software. Um, the software tool had some requirements. We wanted something that was easy to use, um, that enabled rapid development in a collaborative, multidisciplinary environment for studying epidemics. We were, at the time, much faster at generating ideas than at writing code to test them. 
Uh, we preferred open source tools that can easily grow in a community of non-expert users and developers. And we wanted something with an easy interface to existing code bases written in all the old languages, C, C++, and Fortran, um, so we wouldn't need to rework all of our existing tools in a new language. We also needed to load large, non-standard data sets like those generated from our various projects, including Epidemic Spread. Uh, we looked around and, and didn't really find a tool that fit our needs. So we learned about Python and decided to try a pro prototype. Um, and from the timestamp on this real email, um, you can see that this looks like an after hours hack that I made in 2002. Um, this prototype that I made was strongly influenced by Guido von Rossum's 1998 essay on how to represent graphs using Python dictionaries and lists. In this case, I used dictionaries of dictionaries. Um, I say in the email, hash of hashes, which might give some clues about what other languages I knew at the time. I was wrong about the speed. You see here I say it's not going to be fast. Um, not true. Um, it was actually really great um, because the Python dictionary implementation is great, and, and we benefited from that. Uh, it turned out that graph drawing, which I implemented simply using the amazing Graphics package, was important for developing code and finding bugs in our software and algorithms. We started using this hack and, and realized we need to think a little bit about design so our colleagues could collaborate with us and actually use these tools. So and I'll tell you some about the design goals that we started with or that we eventually used for NetworkX. These speak most directly to why we chose Python. We wanted a simple programming interface to the data and algorithms, uh, an easy way to unit test our code. Uh, getting it right was very important to us. We wanted to add clear examples that were readable for non-experts. We wanted good documentation of the language and the code that we built with it. Python met these goals. Another design goal was for compact and direct code. Being applied mathematicians, we liked code that had compact representation, and Python enabled fairly straightforward ways to write algorithms. We tried hard to make things read like we thought in terms of mathematics and algorithms. For example, if the object G was a graph, we wanted to say for node in G or for N in G to loop over the graph nodes. Um, here's a fairly complicated example that generates a graph called a directed scale-free graph as described in this research paper um, on the left. Um, when it was published, I was eager to try out the algorithms that I was developing using this model so I implemented it using Network X. And here's the code. My intent for this slide is not to go through the details, but more just to eyeball the text density on the left, which is the part of the paper that describes the model fully, um, as compared with the 30 lines of code on the right that implements the model. Um, this is what we mean by direct, that it should be sort of reasonable um, approach to writing stuff in as natural of a way that mathematicians think. Um, this translation from research paper to algorithm ended up being a very common way that new parts of Network X were built, both by the core developers and many, many other contributors. Making additions as straightforward as possible enabled that. Another design goal that really isn't a goal, but more of a how we develop Network X, is development through applications. Uh, I already mentioned that we original developers are applied mathematicians, um, not software engineers, um, and we're working on real problems. The focus on solving science and engineering problems and using the code regularly for that purpose kept the emphasis on ease of use and performance. Uh, we also rarely got distracted with building abstractions or generalizations that we didn't need. Um, some of the quirks and warts in Network X are certainly due to the application-driven approach and the lack of a lot of high-level design thinking at the beginning. Um, but I'd like to tell you briefly about a few of these applications, three of these applications, um, to give you some context of the utility of this approach. Um, so first, back to epidemic modeling. Um, social networks are bipartite. Um, nodes are either individuals or locations, like a room or a building or a bus. 
Uh, so we built generators that created random instances of bipartite graphs that had the properties we wanted from our simulation graphs. Um, then we would study ensembles of similar graphs, perhaps larger or smaller, representing larger or smaller cities, with our epidemic models. We also studied the properties of single nodes. A single person social network is shown, for example, in the right figure, and we implemented measures of how similar that person is to connections. These assortativity measures, how like you are to your connections, allowed us to be able to identify potential vaccination strategies. And in another application, the network interdiction problem, um, an evader tries to move from a source node in, to a target node along a path of least cost, while an interdictor attempts to frustrate this motion by cutting edges or nodes, say in a transportation network. This problem is a network problem of finding the set of roads, edges, to remove that maximally increased cost of traveling between points on the network. The mathematical optimization problem is intractable in general. We develop network heuristics based on the concept of between the centrality, a measure of how central nodes and edges are for the shortest pass through a network. These heuristics allowed us to find approximate solutions to the interdiction problem for much larger scale than networks than you can solve with standard optimization methods. Um, here's my last example um, on, um, on research, uh, studying researchers. Can we measure the impact of journals by studying how they are read online? Um, the large increase in journal usage at the libraries and at journal, use, journal sites provides data to answer these kind of questions. Um, we use networks of user click streams for this data to analyze the importance of journals and compare those with traditional citation measures, the kind that we're used to looking at where you cite a paper um, and then highly cited papers get highly, highly ranked as important. Among other metrics, we used PageRank, the original Google algorithm for finding interesting web pages, and HITS, an algorithm that provides information on both hubs and authorities in a directed network. When you load the whole network, uh, you can also use graph drawing algorithms to make impressive looking maps of the journal space, um, which you see there on the right. Those are similar to some of those that were made for the early internet structure. I wanted to show you a timeline of some of the important events in the Network X history. Um, it shows that things develop slowly. Uh, I already mentioned Guido's graph representation essay from 1998 and our initial code starting in 2002. Um, that was with Python 2.2 um, and before the birth of NumPy. In 2003, Center for Nonlinear Studies at Los Alamos held a conference in Santa Fe on networks. This conference was a major inspiration and we learned that many communities were building and using network science software. We found our potential future collaborators and users. Dan Schult spent a sabbatical at Los Alamos in 2004, which led to the first open source release of NetworkX in 2005. Um, we were fairly fast to respond to the release of Python 3 and made a compatible release in a little over a year uh, in 2010. Um, it took seven years to get to a 2.0 release, uh, and the current team is making great steps towards a 2022 3.0 release. Um, here's why recent progress has been great. Uh, the Network X community today is very strong. There's currently a dedicated team of core developers who are leading the push to a revitalized Network X 3.0. The project has financial support from the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative and is a NumFocus sponsored project. Um, there are a lot of exciting new developments under the leadership of uh, Stefan van der Waalt, Jared Millman, and Dan Schult, who are that are the actual developers. I am now developer emeritus. Um, there are plenty of ways to join in and we would welcome your participation. Lastly, um, to wrap up, I'd like to specifically acknowledge as best I can the many people that deserve credit for creating, growing, and sustaining this project. It's hard to count the number of people who have made contributions. Um, it's even harder to estimate the number of users. This project bef started before Linus created Git, uh, and the transition of the software repository to GitHub may not have captured all of the early contributions, but I can see from that that there are at least 597 that have made commits since that transition. 
There have been thousands of questions, answers, and discussions on the mailing list, which has more than 2,000 subscribers. And all of this is so much more than I expected way back in 2002 when I made that first hack. Um, thanks to everyone who has supported Network X, and, uh, and thanks for your attention in, in listening to my story about the history of Network X. Thank you for that presentation, Eric. That was very interesting. And I'd like to go through some of the questions in the Q&A widget that came up. Quite a few questions asked, some by me. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on some of these, or I'm sure the audience would love to hear. One of the questions uh, that came early in the presentation was, libraries like Pandas and NumPy include a lot of code that's written in C or Fortran. Libraries like Xarray boast having no compiled code. Why does Network X choose to be a pure Python library? Wouldn't compiled code help with performance? Yes, compiled code would help with performance. Um, and um, there are other great network libraries that have chosen that pathway um, and, and can scale actually to quite large networks on, on large high performance computers. When we started developing Network X, we wanted to keep the bar very low for people to be able to use and install um, the tool. Um, there have been, you know, things are great today, more, more or less great today in being able to do multi-language programming, but um, there have been lots of steps along the way, and it wasn't always as easy to get all of that packaging and tooling installed and working. Um, certainly, um, we made heavy use, and, and the scientific Python community was a big inspiration for us to develop and, and, and helped us develop Network X. So when the the uh, numeric and numarray and then later numpy we always used, um, and those are written in in uh, compiled languages and offered excellent performance for some of the tooling related to linear algebra and differential equation solvers and other things that we also needed as ancillary uh, to to the main Network X project. Um, over the years, we've we've tried to do things like write a better um, hash algorithm. Uh, dictionary algorithm to be specific about um, how we might get better performance. Uh, the Python code is really wonderful and excellent and is actually much better than you think. Uh, really fantastic. And we decided that we like the flexibility that in using pure Python, we could use practically any object for nodes and edges. And that created a huge amount of flexibility. There are people that have developed um, multi-level graphs where a node is another graph. Um, and it's graphs all the way down. Um, so that's pretty interesting and something that would be much harder to do with uh, a hard typed compiled language. If I can follow up on this, and I think maybe some of our panelists from Brookhaven can also chime in. Did the ease of deployment of this software, the ability to just give somebody a PIP package rather than having to figure out how to get a compiler on their machine, did that make a difference? Um, I'll, I'll start in with that and, um, and remind everyone that this was well before PIP. <laughs> so yes, a lot of these decisions were, were back when packaging was hard and, and distributing complex software was hard. Um, and yes, that did make a big difference, was being able to, to simply deploy stuff. Um, maybe someone else would like to chime in. I'll chime in and say Conda has certainly changed the landscape and the trade-offs involved in shipping compiled code but if you've got a simple pure Python uh, project that solves your problem, that's, you know, it's always fewer things that can go wrong, right? <laughs> Looking at the Q&A widget and working back from earliest to latest, there was a question for Tom or Eric about the experience with work, making work-related code open source. Were there any big hurdles? What was the approach? Was it something that was very easy to do? Was it very difficult to do? So I will say at, um, at NSLS2, we started early on, we started um, open first, and we get, we have a, we were lucky enough to have our, our facility director uh, be supportive of this, and we have a blanket ability to make our new projects open. I suspect, uh, as someone said in the questions, this is likely to vary wi widely site to site, and you should talk to your local site office about what the rules in that are. I'm sure Eric has a very different experience than I did. Uh, we certainly have different rules than you are, but we love open source software. We're big users of open source software. We like to make our software open source when we can because we like the community and the uh, the quality that we get from 
from open source, and we'd like to be part of that community. Um, so yes, um, it's it's different at all the laboratories, but um, I hope if you're interested in making a project open source that you will you will figure out how to do it at your laboratory. If you're certainly at Los Alamos, um, I, I'd be happy to help you. Was it worth the effort? Was it worth the difficulty of doing? Even if it doesn't mean that other people will help you, even if it just makes gives you more users and more headaches and not more contributors. Uh, absolutely, for me, um, that that the the project would have uh, possibly never never got to anywhere close to the scale and impact that it has without everyone that contributed. And you can't do that um, if they can't see your code. <laughs> and I I, I agree. So, so the the BNL the work the, the projects we started at BNL and then open source because they were just in the open. It made those initial collaborations with APS, uh, uh, Slack, you know, Slack, SSRL, uh, all so much you know, all so much easier because instead of having to negotiate multi layers of authentication or email someone a tarball, you just point them at GitHub and you can start communicating and build, working together quickly, even on completely DOE-related work. Another question in the Q&A widget was for Eric. If you were to write NetworkX today, would you still have used and still chose Python, or would you choose Julia, Rust, or one of these other languages that we hear about in the news? Yeah. Yeah, what if what if those languages existed in 2002? That's an excellent question. Um, I'm, you know, this is a Python meeting. I'm somewhat language agnostic. Um, I can speak multiple ones, including Fortran. Um, I think, you know, when we made that decision, we were excited about the community around the Python language, and I think that's that's what tilted us. Um, the SciPy community, and now what's grown past that is a, a wonderful community of people that are focused on making quality software understand what scientists need and use and want. It's full of a bunch of people that, um, you know, I, I remember when I would go to the SciPy conferences, I was think like, wow, look at all these great graduate students here that are so excited about their hacking project. They better spend more time on their thesis. You know, it was a lot of people that were really excited about software and computational science. I think that's the power of finding some community like that. I think there are some other languages that have communities like that. Um, and I'm, you know, once you choose the thing that fits your brain and fits your community, um, and and we're, you know, that that's speaking from a, a science problem solving approach. Um, I, I I agree that languages like Julia and others are very interesting, and um, you know, have have fixed some of the um, the uh, issues that that we've confronted along along the way with um, other um, other languages for for use as scientists. Um, that being said, there's a lot of exciting stuff going on in the high-performance computing community around NumPy and uh, and uh, large-scale computing, and, and I think we should pay close attention to that. That that could enable a lot of new things that we haven't been able to do traditionally with uh, interpreted code. And for a follow-up question for our panelists from APS and NSLS2, our panelists from NSLS2 are in the course of building brand new frameworks in Python. So why why Python and why not these other choices? And for our colleagues at APS, they're in the process of deploying these and taking old codes and replacing them with new codes written in Python. Why is Python the bet that you're looking to make? Get first, and Tom, you can take a shot as well. Um, the uh, Python is at a point in its life cycle where it's it's you know nearly the dominant if not the dominant language and so there's just a huge wealth of resources when we started making the choices for the language of the tools uh, that that nsls2 would use that was around 2015 julia i think was pre 1.0 at that point i'm not aware of what the state of the uh the rust uh, scientific computing ecosystem is like but i think for a facility scale, Python is, is at the right point, but we want to be careful to to focus on open source scientific software broadly and not attach ourselves too tightly to uh, to, to Python uh, in its moment. And Pete, did you have something that you wanted to contribute to this as well? Sure. At the APS, we've been developing our X-ray facility to work with scientist contributed software. Uh, for some decades now, and the 
point that I've seen over many decades of experience is that scientists will use the tool that they become familiar with that has uh, enough available libraries to serve the interests that they have to execute. They're not willing to reinvest in new tools unless there's significant advantage. <clears throat> we were at a point uh, 15 years ago when we, our tools were being stretched very thin and we needed to identify a new direction. And out of several directions, we had a variety of languages to look at. And without going through all the pluses and minuses, Python really satisfied the vision of sustainability for the future. Hard to predict more than 10 years in advance, but it looked as if that was a good direction to follow for uh, reconverting existing codes into Python protocols because the community, even at the time of the mid 2000s, was growing. Python was being um, advanced. There were new versions of it. Things were being improved and it continues through to today. So this looks like a period of sustained growth and also a broad community where there's uh, adequate information available on the internet to provide guidance for people who want to learn more. So this appeared to be a strong decision why we would want a facility to concentrate on one language rather than a polyglot. Uh, I'd also add that um, Python was originally developed as a teaching language, and then that's a, having scientists go from not knowing the language to being able to do something productive is a very short spin up time. Um, it, you know, so the code is accessible to almost all of our users. And Python is now becoming one of the primary languages taught in undergraduate. So as new students come up through the system, they come in already knowing it and knowing a lot of these tools, which is a big advantage for getting, again, getting people going with the tools just as quickly as possible. Open to all of our panelists, I wanted to pick on a particular turn of phrase that both Pete and Dan used. Dan said facility scale, and Pete talked a little bit about how this applies to that facility scale. What does that mean to you? Is this part of the consideration for Python? What makes it facility scale? I think the Dan. size of the community of users is what makes it facility scale for me. We can, if we're building a tool for a specific research paper or a specific research group, or even a specific scientific technique at a facility like a synchrotron, you've got a, such a broad range of activities that you need a generalist language. And I saw, I'm not gonna remember who to attribute this quote to, but someone cleverly said, Python is the second best language for everything. You can find better languages for any given activity. But if you're trying to do the, the broad range of everything from data acquisition to analysis that we tend to do at a facility, data management, web stuff, you know, uh, HPC stuff, having a language like Python that is a polyglot language uh, is a very good fit. I think that's really what I have in mind. Pete? You said things that I would be saying. So I'll contribute one thing that people haven't covered, and that is to try to stem the trend, the tendency of people towards polyglot. We have to consider that not only are we uh, choosing a language for our facilities, but we're choosing a language that our facilities will expect their outreach communities to also use. And it's the outreach communities that are one of the biggest influences of polyglot because they don't see the need to support a facility. They have their own immediate data collection uh, priorities and they'll pick whatever tools are convenient for them to work in. So if, but we recognize early on that if we all contribute to a common set of tools, that that common set of tools will grow stronger and our facility will grow stronger faster that way. So we did that in terms of control system. Now we're trying to focus on data acquisition languages. So there's strong payback for everybody working towards this common goal. Pete, are you also referring to, if you're like a visitor facility where you have outside staff coming to work on tools, that this has a direct impact on what you can choose that external staff might be affected by? Exactly. So I'm thinking of our user communities, independent researchers who come to our facility to use our uh, X-ray instruments. And so this is actually one of the other drivers for open source. 
is that the tools that we make and the tools that we use are open source. Their uh, licenses are identified so that people can understand what the limitations are. If we have a commercial user, they'll know what is necessary to comply with the licensing requirements. But we don't have to change tool sets for everybody. We have one tool set that we can use, and our users can use these tools as well. So there was a somewhat related question for Eric and Pete, which is Eric had a really nice slide with a timeline of these tools showing that tools like NetworkX go back 20 years. If you're sitting in 2001 or 2002 trying to make that choice, do I use NetworkX or not? It's a hard choice to make. Pete, Eric, how do you think about how a scientist should actually make that bet on a tool before it has become this massive movement? Go ahead, Eric. Yeah, I mean, I think community surrounding it is pretty important. If there's not a big community, then it becomes a little riskier. Um, even a small community of dedicated folks. I think when I first ran into the uh, the SciPy community in those first meetings were, I went to some out of Caltech that were 50 people, but boy, you could see it in their eyes. These people were gonna make it work. They were motivated. They had the right engineering. You could just kind of smell it. And I I was hooked. And I think once I saw that, um, that was actually, I think, 2003 or four. I first got introduced that. Then it was no doubt in my mind that there was a broader community that would would uh, would help, um, you know, not even if they were directly contributing to the particular package, but all the ancillary things you need to be successful, packaging, you know, all the scientific accoutrements that, you know, have existed in Fortran for uh, seven, 60 years at Los Alamos. Yeah, I could see that happening, and that that was enough for me. So community. Do we have to choose a single language? Is that healthy for the labs as a community? When you get down to it, many powerful packages in Python use multiple different languages. Is it the exposure to the Python language that's important? Or is it the case that, or rather, I think it really comes down to, do we have to choose a single language? And so, panelists? I don't no. think we have to choose a, a single language. I think, however, I've been um, a strong proponent of organizing ourselves around a single language uh, in terms of what we do as a facility or facility interactions. This doesn't uh, prohibit anybody from picking something that's uh, very much specific to what they want to do for optimization. So naturally, when the language begins to get in your way, optimize it. I think I, I agree with Pete. Having Python as the top-level glue language for all of its accessibility and flexibility is wonderful. But then the fact that Python can go down to C and Fortran and C++ extremely easily, uh, particularly with using tools like Cython and uh, PyBind11, gets you the, the best of both worlds where you can get the speed when you need it and get access to the big existing libraries when you need it, but also have um, accessible, easy to distribute code at the top. I have an interesting follow-up question related to that, Tom. You know, it's the case that we all, I think, acknowledge that Python is often not the first best language in any particular task, it may be the second or the third best language. But part of the discussion that we're having is, well, the tools that we want to use exist today. They're right there in front of us for us to use. As the maintainer of a very large package, matplotlib, how long would it take for an alternative version of something like matplotlib in another language written from scratch to actually get to the same level of maturity, the same level of support? What would your estimate be? Clearly, it's not something that can happen uh, overnight. That, that's a, I mean, that, sorry, that, that's, a, that's a hard question, James. Um, I would estimate a couple people for a couple years, best case. And I think that's probably underestimating the the value we received from all the very clever things that our users have done with the, the library that the people who wrote the library did not even imagine was a thing you would want to do. Um, and if you were to write it from scratch and throw that away, you would then have to spend, uh, you know, 15 years relearning all the very surprising things your users want to do. 
And Eric, one of the a little bit of the pushback for one of the answers to the question was about whether you make this open source or not, and whether you'd make it open source even if there were no community contributions. Was a big part of this making it open source that you could see the weird things your users wanted to do with NetworkX and then adapt the tool accordingly. I think that was part of it. I mean, it's possible there could have been no contributors. Um, we had collaborators that wanted to use our tools in the simplest way. I mean, nominally simplest if you think open sourcing software is, is simple in the in the 2000s at the labs. Nominally, the easiest way for them to be able to use and contribute to our software um, instead of some other complicated license or commercial um, type of approach. So I think that was another good reason. Um, there were more. Um, you know, we we. Uh, we were we were hoping other people would use our code, and we know other people aren't going to use our code if we don't uh, give it away. So that I think is just aspirational. And sometimes, um, you know, I didn't I didn't put my first hack out on the internet like maybe someone would do today. Um, I waited a little while. <laughs> so yeah, you know, I had to think about it a little bit. I, I think my original intent was to solve problems, and I realized that. I think when I hit the conference I mentioned in 2003 that everyone was trying to solve the same problems and they were all using crappy software that we could do better <laughs> and let's try. So then maybe that was inspirational why I mentioned it. Uh, there was a question about uh, package managers, Conda, Anaconda, and experiences with those. If Anaconda was in use or Conda was in use at any one site. What was the primary reason? And I want to add one more thing onto this, which I think our LNL panelists can speak about, not just PIP versus Conda versus Mamba, but also tools like SPAC, which is yet another one of the package managers. And so unrelated to NetworkX, but in the same vein of the conversation, do any of our panelists want to speak on their use of Conda, Mamba, PIP, uh, SPAC, and the appropriateness of these for our environments? I just have a couple of comments on Conda. I think others have far more experience. I haven't used a tool called SPAC, uh, but I have used Mamba. And uh, I find packaging for Conda is generally more of a um, bother, a burden, than packaging for PIP. Packaging for PIP is so very easy, but uh, I feel that when I have a Conda package, when I've built one or when I'm using them, I have a higher level of confidence that it's going to work with the other software that I've installed, uh, more likely that it will work properly. Yeah. I just say packaging and software distribution is a surprisingly hard problem because it, it, it's actually, it is a directed graph of dependencies that with what, what packages are built with what. And I think a so back in the day before wheels, you couldn't even distribute binary things with with Python. Usually, like you have to all your users had to be able to compile everything themselves locally. Um, wheels make that a little better, but they lack the metadata required to correctly track the the underlying C libraries and their versions and their API versions. So once you get beyond needing to uh, and that's what kind of what brings in that additional level of metadata, which is why you have a higher probability of working together. Um, for one place where this can bite you is people have tried to install H5Py and Py tables, both from wheels. If you import them in the wrong order, it doesn't work because they both fully bundle a, a, a you know a copy of libhdf5, and there's some weird dependent you know conflicts between them. Uh, whereas with Conda, because it packages H5Py, PyTable, and a libhdf5, all those first-class standalone uh, packages in its system, you are sure to always get a consistent version of them that will all work together. Now, I see some feedback in the Q&A widget uh, about SPAC in particular, and I would like to introduce those of you who are not familiar with it to this tool. It is an open source tool. It is an Unfocus uh, affiliated project. It is a multi-platform uh, package manager that I think is predominantly used uh, for deploying software to supercomputers. It's developed at Livermore Labs by one of Gene and Jane's colleagues, Todd Gamblin. And I'm curious to hear from our panelists if any of you have ever experienced what it's like to, de to deploy Python software to a supercomputer. And is that something which is easy to do using the existing tools? Do you need something a little bit more rarefied like back? Is it the case that there's 
you know, as our contributor here, no one-to-one -one correspondence between this, this view of software deployment. Eric, I think you're probably the only one of the panelists who really, other than our Livermore colleagues, who really directly work on the supercomputing side. Deploying Python software to supercomputers, what are the additional yeah. considerations? Um, I think most of our supercomputers are running some, uh, have uh, the Python tool chains that you need to get your work done. I, I don't use them every day to do my work because my work is, um, is primarily in Excel and Word now that I'm a manager. Um, but I, I do think that, you know, we, we, we care a lot and very deeply about making Python work and very efficiently on our large scale supercomputers. So, um, you know, and, and would be happy to, uh, to make improvements on that, um, if we can. Um, so I don't, I don't, I can't speak directly to snags or, or ease of, of deploying stuff. We, we have a lot of software that's Python and mixed language, of course. I mean, it's, 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 uh, it's uh, Fortran, C, C++, everything. Then to extend that question and move a little bit laterally, you know, if you follow the labs on Twitter, as I do, you'll see that the labs love to tweet about the Exascale project, and they love this keyword, Exascale. I'm curious, specifically from one of our panelists, Tom at BNL, is Python an Exascale technology? How does this hype this this movement fit into the tools that we're talking about here i i i don't think i can speak to that james I, i'm not i work far enough away from exascale that i i have very little direct experience with that fair enough do any of our uh, contributors want to talk about oh go ahead i i'm i'll i'll weigh in i'm part of the exascale computing project and and uh we write python code um we run python code um, we use Python code to test stuff. We use Python code to scale stuff. Um, you know, it's absolutely part of exascale computing. Question, you know, if the question is, is a piece of Python software running at whatever exascale means on a large machine? We don't have one quite running yet. Um, I don't know the answer to that, but is it part of the whole ecosystem in the same way uh, Linux is and everything else. Absolutely, it's you know we can't we can't take away Python and expect to succeed on on running our large scale applications at the exascale for many reasons. I hope, I, I maybe, hope that, that doesn't I hope that doesn't uh, con contradict what the exascale computing project thinks about their software tool chain, but that's how I think about it. So perhaps a follow up question might be, what is the sweet spot for Python? And I think something that Tom mentioned that I think was very interesting was it seems like a lot of Tom's work doesn't really encounter, you know, Tom, what other scales are there other than exascale? What other modalities of computing are there that need to be recognized? Um, I think there are, um, I mean, well, basically every scale from from exascale down is exist and used someplace in science. I think it's, uh, we can't neglect, you know, a lot of work is still done by individual uh, researchers on a desktop scale machine or a workstation scale machine um, that they have complete control over. And that's where some of the cutting edge, like someone just can play and do whatever they want to test it out. There's things that like, uh, like things that allows like what Dask allows you to do to get access to a couple hundred nodes. Um, you know, for your parallel distributed prompt computing needs. And then up to, I know Python's using the tool chain of like in uh, high energy physics, you know, where they're running massive batch jobs across thousands and thousands of nodes, Python's involved in that tool chain as well. So I think it, uh, I think there's an application for Python at all of these scales. If it's necessarily the thing that is being scaled out to the thousand InfiniBand connected parallel nodes, I don't know, but it's someplace in that tool chain, either in kicking it off or collecting the 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 smaller scale data that is that results from those very large simulations that someone finally works with for that last mile to get it out into a paper. Now, as we reach the close of our call, I want to put out one last request for any questions from any of our participants or any of our panelists for any of our other panelists. 
If you're a panelist, obviously you can just jump on audio and ask a question. If you are in our in, a, in our group of attendees, you want to put that in the Q and A widget. But I'm very curious if there are no other questions for just a couple of quick closing notes, and if our panelists could maybe speak to this core question that we came here to talk about, you know, why Python in the first place, what that question means to you. So I'd love to take this as an opportunity to go through our panelists and have them just share with us a couple of thoughts around that common central question for this session. Would you like to start off, Eric? Uh, yeah, well, thank, thanks a lot for the uh, for invitation to this event. This is really interesting. And, and I think I kind of weighed in quite a lot already on, on why Python. So maybe I'll, I'll just pass the baton immediately to my other panelists that might want a chance. If we'll go in introduction order, then I'll, I'll hop in next. Uh, really to echo something that Eric has already said, um, the, the Python community is a really wonderful community. Eric mentioned, I think, the, the SciPy conference, which is what hooked me in, and that you know exists also in, in a virtual space and more and more within the DOE. And uh, it's a really lovely group of, of helpful people I've found, and uh, I think there's a lot of value in trying to, to pay that forward uh, throughout the rest of the DOE. Eaton, Joe, would you like to speak? Oh, go ahead, Tom. Is it, following on Dan's uh, introduction order, um, I think what, what hooked me on Python was the speed at which you know I as a as a grad student could go from I have an idea of a thing I want to try to working code that told me if that was a good idea or not. Um, and that's a combination of the language itself and the broad suite of tools that exist. Uh, to, to help us. Pete and Joe, would you like to speak to this question, why Python? I think Python is, as many have said, it's very easy to adopt as an initial language or, or initial learning um, how to use things. It offers interactive command line, which is desirable from a scientists point of view when they're interacting with their measurements so that's good and it has the tools to scale up to many more advanced capabilities so jane jean would you like to chime in why python um uh, sure i will um you know i guess just from a uh, pure engineering perspective you know, I like to, you know, I've always like to follow the the trends and uh, hop on, you know, hot technology. And, you know, the fact is, you know, I, I spent most of my career, uh, you know, developing an epics in the machine control level. And the, and that, that's a, epics is a, um, is a, uh, uh, you know, large, um, uh, Free, you know, free software that has a lot of collaboration, and you know, kind of the the trend in Epics was toward Python and uh, some some influ influential developers uh, created a nice um, interface between Python and Epics, and so you started to just see it, you know, people started to use it just because it was available as a way to get access to uh, control systems. So. And our colleagues from Livermore, Jean and Jane, if you'd like to chime in. Otherwise, I want to share with you one or two questions which came up in the Q&A widget just at the last moment, which I don't know that we're going to have time to answer in this particular session, but we may answer in future sessions. Questions of the form, what was your route to getting Python, a Python tool funded, especially in the before it's a ubiquitous phase? And this actually comes from one of uh, our contributors to a workflow tool written at Livermore. And another question about Python maintenance being notoriously difficult. Some easy things like duct typing make it the maintenance or long-term maintenance hard. What are our thoughts on type hinting or other methods? If any of our panelists would like to speak very briefly to either of these two questions, we can include this here, but we can definitely find time in a future session to talk about long-term Python maintenance, the funding of projects, other concerns. Anybody want to speak to either of these two before we adjourn? So I just want to plug a blog post from uh, Andy Mueller, one of the core developers of Scikit-Learn, where he basically argued that no 
no new software project should ever be funded. You should only fund software projects that exist because if it exists, it proves that it solved a scientist's problem to the point where they, they wrote it, at least that it works. And once it, once it exists, funding can help it improve, grow, become reliable. But projects that are funded from the beginning to be projects, um, he went, went through and did a, a study, and a lot of them, as soon as the funding stopped, the development and usage stopped. Whereas projects that tend to start by solving someone's problem and really are focused on an application uh, tend to live on. Or any of our panelists want to speak to either of these two questions before we call the session to a close? I truly second Tom's remarks. I think it it has to show purpose. It has to show love and intent on doing things and then the money will follow. I find there's actually growing stronger reluctance to fund plan developments for software that there's been too much paperware and not enough real progress. So you have to show something before you're able to establish funding. And any final thoughts on these questions or any others from our panelists? If not, I'd like to thank all of you for being a part of this very first session that we're holding. Uh, I'd like to especially thank our panelists for being a part of a very lively and spirited discussion and the folks of you who are asking questions, although some of them came in just at the very last moment without leaving us too much time to answer them. Uh, I'd like to specifically thank Eric for coming to present about NetworkX for us, and hopefully that he'll be in touch and we'll be able to bring him back for future sessions. Some of the questions that came up in the Q&A widget, we weren't able to answer in too much depth. And these are questions that we can dive into in future sessions, questions about how do I actually maintain a long-term project? What, is, what, do, what do you think of things like PEP40 for type hinting and some of these changes to Python as a language because modern contemporary Python looks very different than it did back when NetworkX was first starting out. How do we actually handle the funding of open source and the governance of open source projects or even find funding for these projects? These are all questions that we can answer in future sessions. But with that said, why don't we adjourn at this point? We will resume with the next one of these calls on Wednesday, December 1st. We'll be in touch with all of you very shortly with a copy of the video, which we'll edit a little bit just to make it as seamless and as watchable as possible, and with details about future sessions. Thank you all for joining us. It has been an absolute pleasure being a part of this and seeing the lively spirit of discussion, and I hope to see all of you in the future event. Remember, come bring your Python questions. Our panelists will try their hardest to answer them and to help connect you to the resources that you need. And if you are interested in being a panelist, if you're interested in representing your site amongst all of our panelists, please be in touch. We would love to have more voices as part of the conversation. But with that said, thank you all for joining us tonight. See you next time. Thanks, everybody.